seems like so many people are talking, but is anyone listening? I get so angry about what's happening. I wish I could talk about it. I read the Bible, but is it really relevant today? I wish we could just talk about it. Well, good morning and welcome to everyone here, those joining us online in the Woodside Room at Minnetonka and at Bush Lake. It's a joy to be with you today. My name is Zach Bush. I have the privilege of leading uh, as the campus pastor at our Bush Lake campus. And one quick word, we made it through the polar vortex, right? (laughs) Woo! Yeah, there's strength in numbers, strength in community, right? Uh, Well, over the last several weeks, we've been looking at this series called Unstoppable. We've looked at the first few chapters of the book of John. But today we're taking a little bit of a time out uh, to cover this topic called Crucial Conversations. Throughout the year, Pastor Joel has uh, planted little Sundays where we'll take on specific topics, things such as anger management, confession, serving, and race within our country. As you can gather, it's a crucial conversation. And as I was thinking about it, I was was preparing for this talk this morning, it reminded me of a conversation I had back in college. I had the chance to meet this new college minister, and we wanted to get together and and have lunch. Uh, Now, before he and I got together, it was a little bit of what I was doing during my four years in college. I wanted to really leave an impact. And so I found myself involved in just about every single event and activity you can imagine. I was a part of the student government. I was giving leadership to the freshman orientation called Welcome Week. I was leading Bible studies on the hockey team. Uh, And it was really, like I said before, I wanted to learn how to be a leader, but I also wanted to leave a big impact. And as we sat down across the table, this college minister looked at me and he asked me this question. Zach, don't you want to leave an impact greater than your four years here? It's kind of like, who do you think you are, right? It kind of stung a little bit. I was like, don't you know what all I'm involved in? Like, I mean, don't you see what I'm doing? But I was a little bit intrigued. And so I said, yes, do continue. And he said, Zach, don't you want to leave a legacy? Everyone say, ooh, (laughs) legacy. And so it got me thinking a little bit more of how do I do just that? Now, maybe for some of you, you've had a similar conversation or a thought in your mind of how do I leave an impact? Because when you look at your schedule, it's, it's very reactive. You're moving from one thing to the next, from a coffee meeting to a board meeting to soccer practice to anything and everything. And you're asking this, yourself this question, am I leveraging my time in such a way that I'm really making a key impact? Maybe when you look at your friendships, you're asking yourself, am I making a big difference with all of these different relationships? Or when you think about your nine to five, you ask the question, am I leaving a legacy with my career? Well, as you can guess, that's really the central point of our talk today, and it's this, how do I leave a lasting impact? Okay, how do we leverage our time, our resources, our relationships in such a way uh, that will have a a legacy, an impact that reaches far beyond our time here on earth? And so it's going to be a great talk this morning. Uh, I invite you to pull out your teaching notes. We're going to be looking at the life of the Apostle Paul. And for many of us here, we're sitting today in a church because of the impact of, of Paul thousands of years later. Uh, And so as we walk through the life of the Apostle Paul, we'll see three key points. Uh, We'll see first that to leave an impact, it demands a a calling, a companion, and then third, a commitment. All right, but let's go ahead and dive right on into our very first point, which is a calling, and it's this. Calling is a unique impact we have on this world. All right, calling is a unique impact we have on this world. I'm going to elevate that word unique because there's only one of you and there's only one of me that can leave a unique impact on this world. And when we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, he was no different. Now, before he understood this calling that God was leading him into, uh, he was one who persecuted the church. He hated Christians and he had this reputation of, of a Christian killer. And so as he was on his way to Damascus, there was a disciple there named Ananias and God wanted to give this calling to Paul through Ananias. But Ananias was like, no, 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 no. Like, I know this guy. I know the reputation he has. And he kind of gets into this wrestling match with God, right? But we know how it goes, right? God always wins that wrestling match. But here's the conversation between God and Ananias. He says, Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard the many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. 
And when we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, he was a man ha- that had a very unique set of skills. Okay, he was uh, growing up in the, the school of Gamaliel, which back in the first century was a lot like the, the Harvard School. Okay, it was, it was uh, really one that challenged its students both theologically and intellectually. So he had this incredible intellect about him. But not only that, did he have a, a strict abidance to the law, he also uh, was well-versed in other faiths and other religions. In fact, just a few chapters later in Acts 17, Paul was in Athens, and he was debating with Greek poets and philosophers. So he was theologically and intellectually sharp. But not only that, he had a focus and a drive about him. He was a tent maker, what we would call today an entrepreneur. He could show up in different cities and and start a business and plant a church and do all these great things. But I love what God placed on his life. He said, Paul is my chosen instrument. Chosen in the sense of he is set apart and an instrument in the sense of he has a unique calling. He has a unique set of skills. And when I think about that, I think about that, that word instrument because uh, we have so many different instruments on stage. We have guitars and basses and keys and drums. But I want to uh, ask you to think for a moment. What would it look like if whenever you came in this morning and you grabbed a seat, that all of a sudden for 15 minutes there was nothing on stage but the musical instrument sitting there? And we sat in silence for 15 minutes. All right, it'd be a little bit awkward, right? Okay, it's not as if our worship leaders come out on stage and pull out a wand and, and kind of swish it around a little bit and then the instruments begin to float and project sound. Okay, if they did that, you would be like, you got to come check this church out now. It's crazy what they're doing there. All right, no, but what it takes is that each instrument takes a talented musician to strum a guitar, to play drums. And that's what I think that, that is happening here. You see, because whenever we yield our lives to what Christ is doing, whenever we yield our lives to God, the infinitely talented musician, then he will place us and he will perform through us in such a way that we never would have been able to do just on our own. All right, whenever we have these unique set of skills and this unique sound, and God is the one, the the master conductor of our lives, it'll project a, a beautiful orchestra and symphony that we would have never have thought possible. That's what a calling looks like, a unique impact we have on this world. Now, I know what you're thinking. You might be thinking, okay, Zach, calling, that's a great word. Uh, Okay, but what does that mean? We throw that word around all the time. How do I find my calling? The answer is I can't because it's unique to each and every one of us here. Well, what I want to do is I want to give you some reflection questions to think about because when I think about a calling, it's really this. Calling is the intersection of skills, opportunity, and a broken heart. Okay, calling is the intersection between skill, opportunity, and a broken heart. Let me illustrate for you real quick. As, as we look around all of, all of us here, we've got so many different skills. Some of us here are big picture thinkers. Others of us are more detail oriented. Some might be more extroverted, outgoing. Some might be more introverted. Some might have more of a pioneering entrepreneurial spirit. Others might be more maximizing managers. Here's the thing. We all have a unique set of skills that God has birthed within us uh, that we say, God, utilize this skill for your good and for your glory. Second, it takes an opportunity. Now, what opportunities are presented before you? Is it uh, a a job transition? Is it the shift at work? Is it a new family that moved just a few houses down? What are the opportunities? But third, it also takes a broken heart. And simply put, what is it that keeps you up late at night? What is your passion? What does it stir within you? You see, because whenever we begin to think through that, whenever we begin to see, you know what, there's a problem that I want to help solve. There's a solution that I want to bring. That's what uh, our passion can really land around. And whenever we find the intersection between those skills and those opportunities and that broken heart, that passion that we have, that's when we can begin to see this is my calling in life. This is how God has placed and positioned me to have a unique impact on this world. That's our calling. But the second thing is that it takes a companion. And the second point is this, a companion is one who impacts another through invitation and inspiration. Right, a companion is one who impacts another through invitation and inspiration. All right, I want you to think real quick, who is one person who has had a big impact on your life? They've maybe left their mark on you. Uh, chances are is that this person probably invited you into something that you would never have done on your own. And through their life, they inspired you to pursue it. 
Okay, and, and you're sitting there, you're thinking, okay, this is really stretching, and this is really difficult, but I would not have done this without that invitation, without that inspiration. We see this in the life of the Apostle Paul as well. The church is exploding, and there was one man named Barnabas, who was his companion, who extended an invitation and a little bit of inspiration. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 11. This is what it says. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word of Jesus only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw that the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So what's happening here? Okay, the church is just bursting at the scene. People are hearing of uh, Jesus Christ maybe for the very first time, and and they're following him. And and news is reaching uh, to the church in Jerusalem, what's happening at Antioch, and they send this man, Barnabas, who had a great reputation. He was the son of encouragement. And he goes to Antioch, and he begins to see what God is doing, and he begins to teach, and even more people come. I mean, the, the church is just exploding. And what happens? Barnabas knew his limits. And so he said, I'm gonna go, to Tarsus, and I'm going to find this guy named Saul. And I love, he, he literally goes on what looked like a, a college football recruiting visit, and he, he finds Paul, and he invites him, and he inspires him to come back with him to Antioch, and shoulder to shoulder, they teach for years and see even more people come to know the love of Jesus Christ. All of this happened because Barnabas extended that invitation, and he inspired him through his life. And so for a few years, they were there in Antioch, and the church continued to grow, and eventually they said, you know what? Uh, We want to be a church that has a worldwide impact. And so they lay hands and they commission Barnabas and Paul, and eventually they go on to plant churches in Turkey and Greece, and Paul makes it to Rome eventually and, and sees this impact extending around the world. But the beautiful thing about it is that this isn't just reserved for the first century. You see, because uh, we, we are experiencing that today here in 2019. Uh, we've heard probably of the 10, 10, 10 vision that we want to plant a thousand churches overseas. And so we have the, the opportunity to partner with an organization called TTI, the Timothy Initiative. And today we have the president and founder, David Nelms, who is going to come and share with us an update of what God has been up to, to have this global impact. So would you please join me in welcoming David to the stage? Thanks, David. Oh, Westwood, I'm so glad to be back here. I was with you last year. I've missed you. Uh, You guys are just so, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, Scandinavian-ish, okay? Uh, You're kind of cute too, some of you at least, but glad to be back. I was actually with your pastor this week down in Orlando and got to have lunch with Pastor Joel and I had the opportunity to thank him for his incredible vision. If you're new here and you haven't read the wall out there as you come in, my goodness, what, what a vision you have for disciple-making and planting churches. And I'm here today to thank you also. I want to thank you for letting God use you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for getting off the sidelines, and thank you for getting into the game. If I heard Pastor Joel say anything this past week, he said it over and over again, we got to get in the game. we got to get in the game. we got to get everybody in the game. Westwood, you're making an eternal difference, not just here on this earth. You're not just changing lives. You're changing heaven. You're changing hell. You're planting Jesus. That's what churches are. When you plant a church, you're planting Jesus. You're planting Jesus in parts of the world where they've never heard of him. They do not know who he is. They're not rejecting him uh, because it's their choice, but rather no one has ever even told them uh, who he is in the first place. And just dozens of churches are being started. Let me show you a couple of pictures. You're starting churches on mountaintops across Asia. Isn't that a beautiful view? Isn't that something? You're planting churches in stairwells, uh, neighborhoods, all over, all over 
uh, cities all over uh, several countries in Asia. And the, the stats are beginning to pile up. You are training right now because of your, your investment, your prayers. You're training 270 plus Timothys and Tituses. Those are church planters. And they have already, just in about 10 months, a little less than 10 months, have already started 87 churches. That number is going to explode in just a few months. These churches are already caring for 31 orphans. There's 31 orphans that are being cared for today because of you. And that last line is incredible. There's an ethnicity there, the, a, a people group called the, the Kahar. And previous to you guys' involvement, they were what's called an unengaged, unreached people group. That is, according to the experts, there was no Christians, no churches, no, none of them were followers of Jesus Christ. But because of your prayers and your giving, because a bunch of you have gotten into the game, you now, we now have four churches there among the Kahar people. And that may not seem like a lot, but to go from zero for 2,000 years, to go from zero all of a sudden to four, it is absolutely incredible. And you're just getting started. It's going to get, it's going to grow. The thing, though, that I want to make sure you understand before I sit down is this. The, don't think stats. Think people. These, these are real people that we're talking about. Out at the info spot, we have the life story. We have the story of a lady named Sabita. You can stop by and pick it up if you'd like. Sabita is one of the people that have been reached this past year as a result of your influence. Sabita was in her 80s. She had already outlived the average lifespan for her area. And in that part of the world, when you're at that age, the elderly are looked at with great respect, almost like gods. And usually they will come into their children's home and live there. Their children serve them and take care of them. But Sabita has a stubborn streak. And she refused. She wanted to stay in her own house. She wanted to be alone. Well, one day the villagers were talking and somebody said, hey, I haven't seen Miss Sabita for a while. And someone else said, I haven't seen her either. And no one had seen her. And they went to her home and they found her unconscious. They picked her up. They carried her some distance away to the closest hospital. The doctors could not determine what was wrong with her. They said she's in a coma but we don't know why, and we, therefore we can't offer any treatment. We don't even know what's wrong with her. They said, take her home and let her sleep. And so that's what they did. They took her home, and she remained in that uh, coma. Well, one of your Timothys heard what was happening to Sabita, and he gathered together the church, members of that little church, and they went to Sabita's home, and they gathered around her bed, and they prayed over her. And they prayed, listen to this, they prayed in the name of Jesus Christ. And they prayed in Jesus' name that she would awaken. And you know what? That's exactly what she did. She just, she just woke up. And the first words out of her mouth were these words, Who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? And I don't have time to go into the story. It's out there if you want it. But there was a de demonic, dark oppression that was involved there. But that darkness could not hold on to Sabita once they started praying in the name of Jesus. Sabita gave her life to Christ, became a follower of Jesus Christ. She's now part of that church with her daughter and the, the others there. And she is in the game. She is telling people, 80 years old, but she's telling people everywhere about Jesus Christ. Well, that's what I want to encourage you. Get in the game. Don't grow weary. Don't grow weary until every single man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of this earth has had an opportunity to hear of the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be out at the info spot. We're looking for people to pray. Come see us. And if you're interested in being a disciple maker right here, we're getting ready to start a, a group up. We'd love to involve you. Thank you so much, church. Thank you. Well, as David mentioned, we'll have TTI representatives at all of our info spots at our numerous campuses, but we love that challenge, get in the game, and so we want to do that just now. Would you please join me as we pray for David and all these Timothys and Tituses and the churches that are being planted? Let's go to the Lord. God, we are grateful that you are a God who is on the move. 
And often we are just trying to hold on for dear life, uh, for your movement and, and, and the things that you are doing. And so, Lord, we pray for David and the staff at TTI. We pray for vision, for clarity, uh, Lord, that they can continue to advance the call of discipleship for reaching people with the love of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we pray for these Pauls, these trainers, these Timothys, these Tituses, all these church planters around the globe, uh, that they will have boldness, that they will have your peace, that they will have your presence, and that they will have your power. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, against persecution, that uh, they're experiencing the difficulties that arise. And we pray for those in their church as well, the mission field that's before them. Uh, Lord, may you prepare hearts, may you prepare the harvest Uh, so that seeds will be sown and that people will come to know your hope, your joy, and your love. We pray all this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, thanks, David. Appreciate it. Let's give him a round of applause. Yeah, one more time. Thanks. Well, what I love about that is is that it's not just happening 2,000 years ago. It's not just happening in Nepal, but it's happening here in our own backyard, that as we think about what it means to extend the kingdom of God, uh, that we realize that we need to find this companionship. And you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, that's great, Zach, but how do I personally find a companionship or a a companion like the one that you're speaking of that will uh, leave an impact on me through invitation and inspiration? And we've uh, come up with a, a, a term here that's phrased, who's your next? And so within all of our teams, all of our groups, we're inviting our leaders to think through who is it that's on your team that you can invite, that you can inspire, that you can uh, point to Jesus for their lives. And here's the thing, we realize that within any growing organization, that there's naturally going to be movement, that people will move across the country or that people will move to a new campus or a new location and they will leave spots vacant. But hopefully the idea behind it is that they have someone who's filling in, who's stepping up into leadership for that because that person is there next. Now, it doesn't just mean that uh, you're receiving this, but it also means that you can extend this idea of who's your next in your own sphere of influence. When we look at the life of Paul and the first few parts of Acts, it was really Barnabas, Paul, Barnabas, Paul, Barnabas, Paul. But then a shift happened and it became Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. As we're learning with TTI, he poured into Timothy's and Titus's to plant churches. And so the question to you is this, who is your next within your sphere of influence, within your circle? Is it the new family that moved just a few houses down? For our students, you also can have an impact. It's finding those classmates that are new to class that you can pour into, that you can deposit in, that you can invest your life into theirs. Because here's the thing. When we think about the impact that we leave on this earth, it's not what we've grown. Rather, it's who we've grown. We have to shift our thinking to say leaving an impact means leaving an impact on people and not just on things. You see, because companionship biblical companionship in this idea is leaving an impact on someone else through invitation and inspiration. We see that it takes a calling, it takes a companion, but third, it takes a commitment. And the commitment is this, pour yourself out to fill others up. When we think about having an impact that extends beyond our life here on earth, it means to pour yourself out to fill others up. Now, if we were to really boil this point down, if we were really to summarize it into one word, it would be this, serve. It would be be others-centered, serve one another. And we look at the life of Paul. He did this also for Timothy. He placed Timothy as a senior pastor of a church in Ephesus. And uh, towards the end of his life, Paul would write back to Timothy to encourage him. But Timothy was experiencing some difficulties. You see, people were rebelling against his leadership and they had deaf ears to his teaching. But Paul, in some of his final words, coined these phrases, this word here. He says, but you, Timothy, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Uh, You could just imagine that Timothy, people are not listening to him. They're rebelling against his leadership. He's probably feeling a little bit discouraged. Maybe he's thinking, should I hang him up? But Paul encouraged him. He says, no, 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 no. Uh, you continue, you endure, continue to teach the things that I have taught you. Uh, remain steadfast through it all. For, he uses this important word for, it's a connective conjunction that's causal. He says, because I am being poured out like a drink offering. And don't forget the things that I've done for you. I've poured my life out for you. 
Now, what Paul is saying here is he's hearkening back to an Old Testament image that when the priest would sacrifice uh, an animal, be it a, a bull or a ram or a goat or a sheep, the priest would oftentimes come and they'd do one final uh, drink offering. They would pour wine out on the altar as sort of their final exclamation mark. They would say, this is the last little bit of the offering that we have. And so what I think Paul is getting at is he's saying, this is my curtain call. This is the final exclamation mark on your life, Timothy. I've poured everything that I have into you. I've deposited everything that I have and you should be encouraged in it because of the work that I've done and because of what the Holy Spirit and the work of Christ has done in and through your life. Pour yourself out to fill others up. As we think about it, whenever we say yes to this calling, when we say yes to, to finding our next, to, to inviting and inspiring people, whenever we say yes to committing and pouring ourselves out, here's the thing, whenever we get in the game, as David said, the kingdom of God will expand. People will be reached. They will see the love of Jesus Christ and they will experience a newfound sense of hope and joy. And the beautiful part about it is this is already happening here at Westwood. It's happening here at Shanhassen. It's happening at Minnetonka. It's happening at Bush Lake. And, and I could tell you story upon story of what has happened at Bush Lake over the last several months, but I'll spare you that. And I'll share with you one example. As we were getting ready to launch, we had so many families come and, and say, we want to go and be a part of it. But we don't just want to be a part of it. We want to step in and volunteer and lead. And there was one guy in particular. Uh, his name was Jerry. I'll save his last name to protect the innocent. But Jerry is a renowned attorney at Thompson and Reuters. Okay, if he would have just stayed in his own lane, like he would have had an impact and an influence that's greater than, than many of us. But Jerry came forward and he said, I want to step in and I want to lead. And we're like, this is great. Jerry, you could lead really anywhere. Where do you want to lead? And he goes, you know what? I think I want to lead in our next gen ministry. I'm like, okay, all right. And he goes, yeah, I want to lead in kids ministry. I want to lead the nursery. Yes, all right, let's go. And so Jerry began to, to lead within our nursery with the team there, and he's done an incredible job. And when I was talking to him this past week, I asked him, Jerry, why did you want to lead there? And he said, you know what? There's something so tranquil and peaceful about holding a baby. And I thought, yeah, most of the time. <laughs> but he's making an impact that's far greater than he can ever think, hope, or imagine. You see, because when families come through, when couples come through, and they allow us as a team to watch their children, they have an opportunity to go and to receive a, a phenomenal worship and, and teaching time. They, they have a chance to maybe take a breath for a moment. But it's not just that Jerry is not, and the team are not just serving the families. You see, they are serving these little ones. And here's the reality of it. Jerry is not just holding a baby on a Sunday morning. He's holding the next generation of leaders in our church and in our world. And he is pouring his life, he's pouring Christ-like character into them and he's impacting and influencing them for kingdom good. It's an incredible thing that if we want to have an impact, what do we do? We serve. Pour yourself out to fill others up. And so we want to invite you into that. We want to help you leave a lasting impact uh, but I know what you're thinking. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, uh, have you seen my schedule? I, I don't really have a lot of time or, or maybe I don't know where I'm going to fit or I, I, it's, maybe I, I don't know how I can really make an impact or a difference. And, and we acknowledge that those are all valid uh, reasons, but we want to come alongside you and help you in that. I've got two invitations for you, one of two. The first, you'll notice that inside your program is a serve card. Uh, we invite you to pull that out, take a look over it. And there might be a ministry or two that interests you. We, we encourage you to, to check it and then drop it at the info spot on your way out today. Uh, this simply begins a conversation. Okay, you're not signing in blood the rest of your life away. Uh, we simply want to have a conversation with you about where you might be able to fit in. The second invitation uh, is we want to invite you to next Saturday. We're having what's called the Westwood Leadership Gathering. And the whole point of that time together is to encourage and equip you in your leadership, whether you're leading at home, at work, or you're leading here at church uh, as we continue to see what God has in store for us over the next 10 years. So fill out that, info, or fill out that serve card, drop it at the, uh, at the info spot, um, or think through what it might look like next Saturday as we join together. Uh, but here's the thing. There's no better way for us to remember all three of these things coming together than by coming to the table today. You see, as we think about the world being reached and impacted with, with the goodness of Jesus Christ, it's going to take us all finding our calling, this unique impact that we have. 
It's going to demand of us to, to rub shoulders to be companions with those who we might normally not be companions with in the Twin Cities. And so it's going to mean us saying yes to this commitment to do what people wouldn't ordinarily do and to go where people might not ordinarily go. But here's the beautiful part about it. We have a Savior in Jesus Christ who has done it for us all before us. He is the ultimate servant. As I think about as we come to the table today, I'm reminded of Philippians chapter 2. It's the words that Paul wrote about his Savior. He said these words. He said, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, as a thing to be utilized for his own advantage. But he emptied himself. He took on the form of a servant. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to, obedient to the point of death on a cross. Friends, as we think about it, Jesus is the one who served first. And so as we come to the table, may we allow that to take deep root within our lives, within our souls, and within our heart. And may we allow that to impact us. Would you please join me in prayer? Gracious Father, we come before you now. And we acknowledge full well that, Christ, you came and you impacted this world not through arrogance, hostility, not through power and control, but Jesus, you impacted this world through servanthood, through humility. You became, you humbled yourself so much so that you became obedient to the point of death on a cross, that you poured out your life for us, that in your death we now have new life. And so, Lord, as we receive these elements, may it reverberate within our hearts and our souls, and may it stir up affection to love you more. We pray all of this in the beautiful name of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit.